good morning. It's Wednesday, August 3rd. I'm Dr. Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System, and this is Show Me the Science. If you're a regular viewer, you know we always follow the science, and we have a truly remarkable research story to break down today. Last month, researchers from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York presented breakthrough findings in the treatment of advanced rectal cancer. The news was shared at the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, considered the world's leading professional organization for physicians and oncology professors. The groundbreaking clinical trial showed a 100% complete response rate among trial participants, meaning these patients showed no evidence of any tumors after the therapy, and to date, no progression or cancer recurrence after more than two years. Our panel of experts are excited to talk about these findings. They are surgical oncologist, Dr. John Ashcraft, and I said that wrong, I can't believe, I've known him for years, John Ashcraft, and medical oncologist, Dr. Aid Al-Rajabi. We will also hear the COVID count today from our medical director for infection prevention and control, Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Before we get to our discussion this morning, we wanted to share some important thoughts following yesterday's vote on the Kansas Constitutional Amendment called Value Them Both. As you know, we as an organization did not take an official stance on the issue prior to the vote. We value the democratic process and we follow the law. The people of Kansas have made clear their decision. What does that mean to the way we provide health care here at the University of Kansas Health System? The answer is the vote has no impact on the way we continue and currently provide health care. Kansas law has always and continues to allow us to terminate a pregnancy when it is necessary to save the life of a mother or a vital organ. And those are medical decisions that our physicians are trained to make and work and discuss with their patient. We have always said on this program that as an academic teaching hospital, we follow the science and believe the best medical decisions are made between a patient and their physician. As for the quality of care you have come to expect and trust from us, I assure you our high quality healthcare has not changed in any way with this vote. Let's get started. As always, we start by defining terms you hear us say, and there are some big but very important words and phrases you're going to hear today. The first term is mismatch repair deficient or MMRD. Now that sounds like something my wife thinks when she remembers that she's married to me, but a type, but this is actually a type of advanced rectal cancer. Let's turn to our medical oncologist, Dr. Al Rajabi, to help explain that. So uh, regarding mismatch repair uh, uh, deficiency, it's a condition where uh, there's an abnormality or a mutation in genes that are uh, necessary to fix the mistakes that occur when we replicate our DNA. And that causes... You're saying I make mistakes when I replicate my DNA. Everybody does. Okay. And that's, that's, uh, that's natural, but we have... Uh, like a word processor that actually fixes that in, 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 the, in the process. And that results in the accumulation, accumulation of multiple mutations in these cells, resulting in many times in cancers. And it's most commonly seen in GI malignancies, endometrial cancer. It's also hereditary in conditions like Lynch syndrome. And that's why we see it in younger patients. So mismatch repair deficient is not what my wife thinks about me. It's actually a cancer center term around GI and, and uterine cancers then and young people. That is absolutely correct. All right, well I think I could go either way. The research we're talking about today used a new approach in treating these types of mismatch repair deficient MMRD tumors called immunoablative neoadjuvant, yeah, advent, yeah, okay, I'll try it again, immunoablative neoadjuvant immunotherapy. Okay, now you try and say that five times, see how fast you can do it. Let's break down each of these words and talk about how this approach differs from other standard therapies of surgery, radiation, and chemo. Okay, guys, who's taking that one on? Go so, for it. So, um, uh, so basically, the standard of care right now for colon cancer, it's been like that for decades, is to combine chemotherapy, uh, radiation, and surgery. Um, only about 25% of patients eventually achieve a complete response. That means absolute disappearance of their cancer on the macroscopic or the microscopic level. And this also results in a lot of toxicities, including you know, sexual dysfunction, fertility issues, bowel and bladder issues that are long-term and could affect quality of life. And you feel terrible. And, and well, yeah, we, we definitely do 
an we have an improvement in, in survival, but unfortunately, it does have consequences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this, this new immunoablative stuff, that's a little better. It works a little better. It's huh? much better, and it's using your own immune system to actually recognize these cancers and wipe them out uh, without the need of, of toxic therapies like radiation and chemotherapy and surgery. So immunoablative, neoadjuvant. Ad, wow, I can't believe I'm struggling with that word this morning. Immunotherapy, that's actually a really good thing. It is, it is. And people don't get it quite as ill. Yes. And they feel better, and the drugs seem to work. It's a, call, it's a whole new class of therapy, really. Yes, and they work way better than what we have right now. So yeah. it's, it's actually a, a much uh, a dramatic improvement in quality of, uh, of, of care. So I'm the old man in this room, and I'm just going to say I've been around long enough when this stuff wasn't around, and you watch these patients struggle and, and not do well. This has to feel really good as a cancer doctor to watch this new stuff roll out. It, it's amazing. When you find something that really works for patients and improves their outcomes and quality of life. It, it just, it really makes it all of this worth it. Okay. Now there's also a new monoclonal antibody called dosterlamab. Yes. Did I say that right? Yes, that is all right. correct. Excellent. Dosterlamab is a monoclonal used in the research. This monoclonal antibody is also used in the treatment of endometrial cancer. I think our audience is familiar with the term monoclonal antibody therapy because Hawkeye had been talking about that for two years or more of covering COVID therapies. But the way dostarlamab works sounds something like it, it's out of Star Trek, could have been, or Star Wars. I just want to tell you, Star Trek had far better medical therapy in it than Star Wars, which you never even saw the doctors. Okay, now we got that clear. Blo it's a blocking monoclonal antibody. Dostarlamab is a programmed death receptor. That sounds like Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Blocking monoclonal yeah. antibody, it sounds like a serious opponent for cancer. Tell us how it works. So uh, the body has, uh, a, a very, very effective immune system, and it's a very elegant way of not only fighting off infections like COVID and bacteria, but it also surveys our bodies for abnormal cells, uh, and that could potentially turn into cancer, and um, destroys them. So there are signals that are produced by white cells and sometimes cancer cells called checkpoints. And what they do is they interfere with the immune system's ability to attack a certain uh, tissue. And these checkpoint in, uh, checkpoints like PDL1 and PD1 uh, help the cancer evade um, tumor immunity. And uh, basically these antibodies block that signal, helping the immune system recognize uh, these cancers as bad and reinstating um, tumor immunity. Okay, so that's a pretty big deal, and it does kind of sound like the Death Star, but I guess yes. it's, it works. Maybe the Death Star for our cancer. That's pretty cool. All right, we're going to be, we are now ready to share this amazing story. It begins with comments from four of 14 trial participants who called this therapy nothing short of a miracle. This video was created by the good folks over at Sloan Kettering. Let's take a look. My doctor told me that this is something could possibly change your whole life. When I originally got the news that I was not going to have to undergo radiation and chemo, I was extremely excited. Dr. Cersei explained me about the immunotherapy, the benefits. It went from this really terrifying experience to something where I could feel like, okay, I, maybe I can get through this. That day, I didn't see the tumor. So I was thinking, where is the tumor? And then maybe I thought it's hiding somewhere inside. The doctor told me, like, there is no more tumor. It's a miracle. It was like the world just stopped for a second, and I couldn't believe it. You could ask her, like, I barely reacted because it was like, I was not expecting to hear that news. The first thing I did, I uh, called my mom. Yeah, we both cried. Um, uh, it was life changing. I'm not religious at all, but my friends had taken me to a healing mass prior, and then I got the news from Dr. Sersik that called to say that it was working. So it was a combination of everybody saying it is miraculous, and then also combined with it actually being miraculous. You go from feeling, oh, am I gonna die? Am I gonna lose my colon? And then to find that, like, oh, you're gonna be fine. It's, it's just like, wow, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing feeling. If anybody else wants to go through this trial, they might be more comfortable to hear our words. It definitely saved my life and saved the lives of many others that have been a part of this trial. I couldn't imagine what my life would be like if this clinical trial hadn't been available. I'm a miracle, like right here, standing without any surgery, don't have cancer. 
That is amazing. So, okay, Dr. Ashcraft, that has to kind of warm your heart a little bit. Oh, it and does. you're a surgeon, so it's got to warm your heart. Though. Well, if I had one. Um, <laughs> no, it really does. I think the key thing to notice on that is you notice those four participants, how young they were. And we're, that's what we're seeing more and more in our data is that colon cancers, and in this case, it's more specific rectal cancers, are targeting younger and younger and younger patients. And that's exactly what we're seeing in those data right there. Um, and it's, it's miraculous what they saw, and I hope that the, the survivorship continues as to what they see there. That's a big deal. Now, m most of the time researchers want more than 14 patients, but in this case, it made the front page of the New England Journal and hit all the headlines because of the incredible response, I think. That, that is correct. I, I think um, we, we always want randomized um, uh, de uh, studies with m much higher numbers of patients, but this is a very rare uh, population of patients with rectal cancer that are you know in a unique situation that are young a lot of them do have this Lynch syndrome that we kind of mentioned in the beginning so what is Lynch syndrome so Lynch syndrome is is where you inherit that mismatch repair uh, deficiency so these genes are already knocked out at birth and that's when when you develop um, uh, these these cancers and about five to ten percent of rectal cancers have that mismatch repair which would definitely benefit from that so finding hundreds of patients with the situation around the country or the world may be difficult to to do and I think this is a very early sign that this is an effective therapy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ashcroft, you mentioned that we're seeing rectal cancers in young, or younger and younger patients. Talk about why that is. Oh, I wish I knew. I, I truly wish I knew. I don't think any of us know what's going on. Yeah. Um, there's been hypothesis about processed food and diets. There's been hypothesis about toxins and buildup of toxins and bioaccumulation, if you, which is accumulation of toxins over time in, in organisms. and and the, the answer is we don't know, but, but bar it, it's Barbecue is not part of the problem, right? Uh, we'll talk about smoked meat some other time. Okay, Ooh, I don't like the sound of that. All right, so these patients you saw are young. Um, in the past, we've thought of colorectal cancers as being in older adults. Mm -hmm. Can this drug help older adults too? We don't know, that's just it. This, is a, this study's an amazing study, that's why it hit the headlines, that's why it's, it's remarkable for Dr. Awashabi and his group. But we have to understand that this was a small subset of patients, and much like Dr. Alvashabi said, this is like 4% of all rectal cancers, maybe up to 7 or 8% of all rectal cancers that we see. So it's a really small subset of patients. But this is an excellent launching off point. This is an excellent beginning, and we'll have to see how durable this is, because that's the other criticism. That, of course, they say there was only 12 patients, and we know we want more, much like Dr. Alvashabi said. But the other thing we want is durability, and they went out two years, but we know, and even in our, our good treatment that we're using now, which is called total neoadjuvant treatment, that recurrences can happen out to five years, and so we'll need to see that durability build in. You know, I think that that's a really important point, but it, it, this whole immunotherapy wave, I mean, th this is, makes people excited because oh, the yeah. results are so astonishing. Yes, yes, definitely. So, um, Dr. Al-Rajabi, these patients had advanced rectal cancer. Describe the methodology of the trial. What was the dosing of the immunotherapy drug Dostarlamab? So, uh, what they did was, this is a prospective study, so they basically, I, as soon as they identified the patients with mismatch repair, they were enrolled on the study and they got Dostarlamab uh, 500 milligrams intravenously um, um, every three weeks. Uh, and the plan was to continue monitoring these patients very closely with MRIs, uh, um, PET scans, um, um, ultrasound, um, uh, uh, rectal ultrasounds, digital exams, and biopsies. And depending on the response, the patients would either proceed with chemotherapy and radiation uh, or eventually get to surgery. So what they found after closely monitoring these patients when they received six months uh, of the uh, PD-1 uh, PD inhibitor, uh, they found that 100% of the patients achieved complete response. Uh, where there was no evidence um, grossly of, of cancer uh, left behind and the biopsies were completely negative. And that was one of the endpoints of the study is to look at how many patients achieved complete response at 12 months and 100% did. So they followed most of these patients up to two years. Um, there are some more patients that have been enrolled on the study and, and they will add to their numbers, but for now the, the published data was for 12 patients. But the defect's still there, so it could come back. It definitely could come back, but we uh, suspect uh, a lot of times that, you know, once uh, the immune system can identify these tumors, it could potentially have a very durable response in, in many of these patients. Mm -hmm. And these tumors are so mutated that they are easy for the immune system, once they recognize it, uh, to, to continue responding uh, to some of these treatments. So, um, 
Have either of you ever heard of a drug trial in cancer therapy that had this kind of result? Because no. I, I don't, I'm not aware of one that's no. ever had this kind of result. It's very, it's very, uh, it's very uh, impressive. Yes, I think that we've had a lot of targeted therapies in the in the in the past, but this is definitely very impressive. So when you first saw the headline and you read the story, what did you think? Uh, well, I think I, I think we all suspected it. I think a lot of us, you know, in the past. Uh, have used checkpoint inhibitors in uh, different forms of it and have seen the spectacular responses. This really con confirmed our suspicions and uh, really was a, a very good step towards the right path of really tailoring therapy for these unique patients. Okay, were there a lot of side effects for these patients? There were some. They described diarrhea, fatigue, uh, some nausea, vomiting, things like that. Um, there, I think with any medication we give, even the immunotherapy, there's always going to be some side effects. But I would say from what I read, uh, although they, they just described them in general, from what I read in the study, it was a lot less than what we see our patients go through now. That's absolutely correct. The serious side effects were basically very, very, very limited, and it was only fatigue, dermatitis, and some thyroid problems, but most patients tolerated it very well. I mean, it's a lot better than having rectal cancer. Yes, or, yes. or infertility. Or, or having or the surgery yeah. from it, so. Yeah. <laughs> Says the surgeon. Yeah. It's a big surgery with big yeah. side effects and big yeah. risks. Um, right now, in our standard treatment that we use for rectal cancer with our, tr with our team at the cancer center, we obtain probably a 30 to 40% complete pathologic response rate with our standard therapy, and for us to jump to 100% in the crazy. study, it's remarkable. It is remarkable. That's crazy. So the, the study results indicate that immunoablative research could become the first line of therapy for colorectal pa patients requiring surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Let's talk to us a little bit more about what some of those side effects are you, that you mentioned about how hard it is to do surgery, and why it's so risky. So the we, t we, we in, in the cancer world, we separate colon and rectal cancers. It's important to, to differentiate between the two. Colon cancer, we, we typically, surgery is up front most of the time. Um, the side effects related to the surgery are usually not as severe, but when you're down in the pelvis in that fixed bony pelvis, it, the, the side effects get rather concerning to patients at, at the very least. Um, in men, we talk about erectile dysfunction and retrograde ejaculation. In women, we talk about vaginal dryness and sexual dysfunction. Um, infertility if you're, if you're a young uh, female, as we saw in that uh, report. And so there are serious side effects related to uh, having the surgery. Um, not to mention those are, those are the short-term side effects, but you've got long-term side effects. You know, the rectum has a purpose, and when we remove it, there are consequences to that in terms of frequent bowel movements. There can be some leakage incontinence and things like that. So it's a tough road, so this is really a big deal to folks. So to start the map, Will there be other other types of MMRD cancers out there? Yeah, yes, I think we, we, we've already seen some really good responses in M MMRD cancers. Uh, there are other checkpoint inhibitors that have shown superiority to chemotherapy in the metastatic setting when the cancer is all spread and, and the chances of cure are low. And we've actually seen cures uh, and complete responses in, in, in those situations. So it, it, we routinely at the University of Kansas check for MMRD on all of our patients with GI malignancies, uh, regardless of their stage when they come in, because we knew f f uh, from research that we've, we've done many, many years ago, that started many years ago, that it's important to identify these patients early on because they definitely have better options that we could discuss uh, when, when tailoring their therapy. So it's been more than two years since these 14 patients um, um, who are currently cancer-free have been treated. How does that compare to current cancer rates and survival around, colon, about, around this colon, colorectal cancer? Oh, it's, I mean, that if the data, like I talked about earlier, if, if the durability is there and they sustain this complete pathologic response, it's going to be amazing. Um, we have nothing like that. Like on our standard treatment, as I mentioned before, we might achieve a 30 to 40 percent complete pathologic response rate, but that's with triple to quadruple to even more therapy in terms of chemotherapies plus radiation. And so it's, it's significant toxicities related to what we do now. So that's a, so historically, MMRD would be one of the harder ones to treat, right? Is that, as I, as I understand yes, it? Yes, they definitely don't respond to very well to traditional chemotherapies. And when we did have MMRD patients with rectal cancer before this data, we would treat them with much heavier doses of chemotherapy mm -hmm. because 
uh, we knew that the, the risk of failure was high because of all the mutations the tumor has. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what happens for, what, what has to happen for Dostarilabab to become first therapy, first in line therapy, or is it now first in line therapy for MMRD? Therapy? It's not first in line therapy yet. This is one small study. It's very promising, it's very exciting, but in the end we have to remember as we're here discussing this, we're scientists. We need to follow the scientists, this, the science. This is one small study, it's a, it's a great start. But we need further studies, much like Dr. Arvashavi said, we need randomized controlled trials, we need phase one, phase two. I mean, we're, we're just in the beginning, so we have to start. So if somebody came in right now with an MMRD ther colon erectile cancer, would you be able to give them dostrelumab or would you have to go the traditional route? So dostrelumab uh, is not FDA approved for this indication at this point, so um, uh, getting the drug approved is, is a, definitely an issue. Uh, I think that's, it's something I would definitely discuss with my patients, and I have discussed these options in the past with some of my patients that uh, have this unique situation and, and kind of explain the, the theory behind it. Um, but it is unfortunately not FDA approved yet. There, there has been accelerated FDA considerations in metastatic dis, uh, disease for uh, dolstarumab, but uh, right now, you know, there's a lot of factors that would, would um, you know, affect our ability to pr give the medicine. And I think we really need to monitor the durability of these responses so we could have a better discussion with our patients. Um, but I think it's definitely sparked a lot of excitement in the community. Yeah, it's, it is amazing. Okay, your questions are next. Send them to us uh, via YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network and Twitter. The links are here on your screen, but first, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control and ID Specialist here, joins us with the COVID count today, Hawkeye. Yeah. I just want to take umbrage with you just a little bit. You know, for the past three years, you've been ripping on Star Wars. Star Wars has, they have robot doctors and back to tanks. Yep. So no, they have Oh, but care. come on, they don't have the human side. I mean, the real physicians, right. Eventually, so. we're going to be just put out of business. But Dr. remember, that was, that was a long time ago, too. In a galaxy far, That's far right. away. So it's not like Dr. You. McCoy, come on, bones. So, uh, you know, right now, our cases are continuing to be, you know, higher than we'd like it, Steve. Certainly, I thought we were seeing a downtrend. Um, at least we're under 30. We are at 29 active infections, four in the ICU, however one in the ventilator and 22 in that additional recovery period. And again, I think overall what we know, the reported cases are really holding steady at some sort of, of plateau, uh, but we know that hospitalizations, we have seen that increase the past uh, six or eight weeks. Hopefully that will start to uh, plateau though and eventually go down. You know, I, I was looking at some national numbers and I think we have the, the heat map up there. Um, things have been pretty stable. Mm -hmm. Um, over the last few weeks nationally. There are some areas of the country that are a little up, some areas of the country a little down. You can see the concentration sort of in that central eastern United States and also southeastern U.S. and then kind of over there in the southwest. So we, we, um, we're we seeing this sort of plateau. But, and it completely, and this is showing me the science, and I'm going to be completely unscientific. I think COVID, there's a lot of people out there with COVID right now and the lack of um, any real public health information probably misleads us a little bit, Hawkeye. Yeah. I think a ton of people have COVID. I think this may be our highest surge we've actually had. Yeah, and I, I think we can use that and for our numbers, number one, from the employees here at the health system that are out, but also to our hospitalizations. Um, certainly we know, and there has been a number of studies uh, in the news about that exact topic as far as the reported cases, and that's just because people are doing, there are a lot of home at-home tests, and from what I've heard, um, there are so many more uh, places that have supply of at-home tests and people who are doing at-home tests compared to, say, clinics and, and other pharmacies or hospitals that are actually doing those tests. And the test positivity rate is very high right now. It's 19% on PCR swabs that are reported. I have no idea what's going on with, at, at home tests, and we know that at home yeah. tests are probably still 75 to 80% sensitive or so. Hawkeye, is that about right, you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the best study we have, I think, was published May. It was in the JAMA network. Um, it showed that at home tests, you, you had a peak sensitivity when comparing to the PCR tests, which we know are extremely sensitive for picking up the virus, a peak sensitivity of about 77%, and that was at four days after symptom onset. So if you test negative, uh, and if you're having symptoms or if you know you've been exposed, you know, you probably may have to retest one or two days um, after that subsequently to really finally get an answer, unless you're going to go for a PCR test. So um, most U.S. public schools going back um, mm -hmm. with masking is optional. 
Um, I think there's still going to be a lot of COVID out there. Mm -hmm. We'll have to watch that situation very carefully. It makes me a little nervous. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think um, there's a number of different non-pharmaceutical interventions you can take, certainly masking. We know and have more and more evidence of ventilation, that improving. Um, I think it just really depends what community you are in, whether there's going to be um, masking mandated or just as you said, as it's going to be optional. So we'll wait and see. I think the important thing here is, yes, although kids are um, fair better, in general than adults. We know kids can still get ill, so it's vitally important to get those kids vaccinated, but also if the kids bring it home to caregivers or family members at home, that's extremely important. But also for the people in the school, those adults in the school, um, we need to make sure that our teachers can continue to work. We need to make sure that um, they are not out of school, the teachers, counselors, administrators, uh, because we also know, you know, teachers, we have seen a large uh, decrease in the amount of teachers, but also substitute teachers. And we need to keep schools going. We need to keep kids in school. It helps for their uh, emotional, physical, mental health, but also things such as uh, school lunches and just safe places. So be prepared. We may have to pivot quickly. We'll see how things go. Yeah. Hey, the U.S. has agreed to purchase 66 million doses of Moderna's vaccine that targets yeah. the Omicron, mm -hmm. um, about a $1.7 billion deal. And I think they actually purchased more Pfizer vaccination than Moderna. So we're going to have a lot of this Omicron-specific yeah. vaccination. Mm -hmm. We've talked before. It's going to be aimed at B4, B5. Um, I think that's probably good news. It's going to be a bivalent vaccine now, um, and it'll be available, I've heard anywhere from September to November, Hawk. Yeah, I, again, I think with this bivalent, you know, we saw some maybe increased antibody levels. I, we suspect those antibody levels will decrease as normal immune function, normal antibody levels do. How much better, more efficacious is this vaccine going to be? The ancestral spike that is in that bivalent vaccine, again, two different spikes, just like you said, uh, the ancestral spike and then that B4 or B5 spike. How much more efficacious at protecting against hospitalization and severe disease? I think that remains to be seen, but at least we know we are ramping up to have that supply of vaccine, especially now as people are getting really more than six months out from their last dose. Um, of, of the vaccine. So hopefully that will be coming out soon. I think I saw what earlier mid-September, um, but, but I think overall that's good. We just need to get those vaccine into arms. And what we know is that vaccination and those boosters, especially boosters have lagged. And we, we mm -hmm. have like 67 or 70 percent of all Americans now have yeah. at least one of uh, the first two vaccinations, but they haven't got anywhere near that as far as boosters go. And I think this booster will be especially important. Yeah. Uh, I do think we're going to have a little bit of a bumpy fall, especially the late fall when people start going back indoors. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be a lot of masking going on and, and folks are kind of had that COVID fatigue. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we called that cows, COVID weariness syndrome uh, mm -hmm. a while back. All right, so from COVID to monkeypox now, yeah. let's say that but four children have tested positive yeah. over the last month nationally, including yeah. two under the age of five. What's yeah. that tell us, Hawk? You know, again, I think we need to look at the, the disease. There was an early chance to stop this. There was a very early chance to stop this in Nigeria in 2017, 2018 when when that was going on, monkeypox is not new. Um, there are vaccines to stop it. That hasn't been done. We know about, you know, since May in the United States, we know that this has been going on, especially in certain communities. Um, has it been stigmatized? Hopefully not. We need to get that information out there. There continues to be the vast majority of, of patients who have monkeypox are those in that MSM category, that men who have sex with men. But we know, and we have seen this throughout history and throughout um, other diseases as well, um, it doesn't stick to demographics. It doesn't, the viruses, the infections don't care who you are. We know that other people can be inf uh, infected. Um, and so I think what this says is we need a larger rollout of the preventive measures. Um, need to inform people, how do you get it? What is it? But also those preventive measures such as vaccine, we know those vaccines work. Hopefully we are working on that as a nation and really trying to roll out uh, the supply of vaccines as we get them, uh, but also create that access so that everybody has access to those vaccines. Yeah, it's such an important point. Yeah. All right, Jill, let's see if there's any reporter questions or I suspect some audience questions today. Okay, so no reporters on the line, but I will tell you the viewers show up every day and they always have the best questions. Today is no exception. 
First, a shout out to Dr. Al Rajabi from Alice Campbell Marshall, who says, Dr. Al Rajabi is my incredible colon cancer doctor. Please say hi for me. I'm extremely hmm. grateful. And you got three emojis today, Dr. Oh, Al Rajabi. Wow, that's pretty you good. Got a I would have only given you hi, one. <laughs> I would have only given you one emoji. I don't know about this three thing. Oh, no, no, no. You got grateful Three. hands, a blue heart, and a power emoji. So, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> she has set the bar really high on the emojis. Um, okay, so Sandy and Yin Lang both have a question about what types of cancers could potentially use this type of treatment. Yin Lang specific, specifically wants to know if it would be good for pancreatic cancer. Mm. Um, unfortunately, pancreatic cancer is one of the, what we call cold cancers. Um, microsatellite instability in pancreatic cancer is probably less than 2%, and we definitely check for that. We've had cases that have benefited from uh, checkpoint inhibitors in, in pancreatic cancer, but unfortunately, it's not as common as, as you would see in, in colon and rectal cancer. And you mentioned some of the others, colorectal, yes. and I think you endometrial said cancer, endometrial cancer, bladder cancer, cancer yeah. can also show microsatellite mm -hmm. instability. Uh, we've also had patients with uh, liver cancers or bile duct cancers. Uh, so it, it's a wide range of uh, cancers that could occur because of all the mutations that happen from this uh, condition. Uh, Yin Lang was also asking, um, this immunotherapy is teaching our immune system to attack the cancer cell, right? And he wants to know how long is that procedure? Dr. Ashcraft, I, I saw you shaking your head. Well, it's, it's interesting. So um, what it does, the, the way the immunotherapy works is, the, much like Dr. Arvashabi said, some of these tumors have a way to hide from our immune system. And this immunotherapy stops that ability to hide. It, it makes it to where the immune system can see it. And once the immune system can see it, then it can attack it. Now the interesting thing is that we have to remember our immune system has an, a memory. It has an excellent memory. And so that, that's what we were talking about, the durability and, and the longevity of this treatment. How well is the immune system going to remember this and can it prevent the cancer from reoccurring down the road or give it long durability? Because the, some of the concerns that we, we may have is that tumors mutate over time and as you're treating the tumor, can the tumor find another way to hide? And so that's why the durability and the longevity of this is going to be very interesting. Okay, Johnny has a uh, question for you again, Dr. Ashcraft. She says, my husband has stage three rectal cancer and is scheduled for surgery in September here at KU. What should we expect for his recovery? So, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not enough real information that I can give you 100% what's gonna happen. Because in the rectum, we break it down into whether it's high or low, how close to the sphincter or your control muscles it is how high or close to the, to the, up in the belly it is. And so if it's high up in the belly, he, we can expect that we would resect that segment, uh, do what we call an anastomosis, which put him back together. And then if he received uh, radiation and chemotherapy, which I ha would hypothesize he did, there's a high likelihood of doing a temporary ostomy or a temporary bag to uh, give that anastomosis time to heal. If he underwent total neoadjuvant treatment, which is the, the standard way that we do things right now with our GI team, then we can expect that he would keep his ostomy for at least eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks, somewhere in there. We do a test to make sure that connection is healed and then go from there. Unfortunately, if the tumor is very, very low and close to the sphincter muscles, or too close to the sphincter muscles, then we may have to sacrifice the sphincter muscles in order to get that margin of healthy tissue. And if we do that, then some patients do have to end up with a permanent colostomy for the rest of their life. But if uh, we're able to do an anastomosis and do the temporary bag, if we're able to do the surgery minimally invasive, which is laparoscopically or robotically, which is of course our first choice, then the hospital stay is usually not too bad for patients. They're in the hospital three or four days and usually that's mostly getting used to the ostomy itself and getting education so that when they go home, they can manage it appropriately. Okay, now we've got some really smart people on the line that are asking questions with words that I'm not sure I'm gonna say correctly, so the doctors have to bail me out. Mike we're, wants we got to you know. Covered. Okay, thank you. Everybody but you, right? Yeah, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> yet. I'm going to make fun of you. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Mike says, are the bivalent vaccines being trialed? And is there any concern amongst the doctors with the mixing of spikes without longer term data, as was expressed by a couple of members of Verpac? Do you know what yeah, Mike's so, talking about? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, I do. So, Hawkeye, you mm -hmm. know, it, it really 
The science behind it is, I think, pretty yeah. solid. And we yeah. do this with other vaccines. And the spike, we can, we know how it's going to... I think we've gotten billions of doses in, in mm -hmm. people now. So I'm pretty comfortable with that. Yeah. The question about efficacy is a different question, though. We're not sure mm -hmm. about that part yet. Yeah, I, I think he brings... Uh, the person asked a very good question. So first of all, um, yeah, there were a couple dissenting votes or negative votes on, on Verpac, but those reasons were because they didn't see the efficacy in adding that second spike. We know this ancestral spike has really proven to be very good. Um, so are there trials? Well, there have been trials. That's where they got some of the data from, but also the long-term trials. And it's important to understand the long-term trials, just as we talked about, Steve, against hospitalization, severe disease, and death. That data will continue to be uh, obtained and analyzed for sure. Are there long-term effects? I would say really minimal. There's really none uh, to be thought of uh, as far as um, safety side effects for long-term. So, you know, we all believe and have shown that certainly in the short term, they have been safe. Any long-term, I don't think we really believe that. And again, the Verpac, uh, there were two who said no uh, out of that. And that was just because it wasn't felt that there was noted uh, efficacy, but the main point of that group that said yes, go ahead and do it was because they believed any benefits that could be obtained would for surely outweigh any risk because it was so safe. Yeah, and I think the other point to be made is that when they looked at data, it was really uh, the data was with Omicron yeah. because both Pfizer and Moderna yeah. had ready doses mm -hmm. to be sent out by July or August. But what the FDA and the CDC then says, well, actually, instead of Omicron, we want you to name it BA, uh, BA4 and 5. Yeah. So that had not been tested when they yeah. approved it. But, uh, but that's what happens with influenza vaccination every year. Yeah, and I think we're two years into this. This is a very safe technology. We're actually over a decade into yeah. mRNA technology for um, vaccination. So as far as safety goes, I, I'm, I really think that horse has left the barn. Yeah, I mean, and they, I think this is a safe approach. Just as you said, from the trials, we're probably about um, two years out from when the trial started. We're almost two years out from when the mass vaccination started. There haven't been any uh, signal data signals to suggest any long-term consequences or side effects, uh, adverse events of those vaccines. Jill, we're back to you. All right, thank you. Janet is a transplant patient, it sounds like. She said, my transplant team has said that Evashield or Evashield yeah. Yeah. Evi is done on a lottery system. How do you know where you are on the list? When will it be available so you don't need to wait for your number to come up? Yeah, I think the problem is we don't have enough Evyshell for the number of patients we have yep. to give it because we have a lot of folks who've been transplanted, whether it's uh, liver, heart, bone marrow, et cetera. And this is true all around the country. And so what happens in general, and everybody, every different transplant center may approach it a little bit differently, is that um, you're, you're ranked according to how well you're doing with your transplant. So for example, our lung transplant patients, most of those come from Barnes actually, have, who have really normal lung function are doing really well at or a lower tier than the folks who have more significant problems with rejection and have to have more medication to help treat rejection. And I think that's probably true for bone marrow and all the other talk. And yeah. then what happens is you're, you're put into a group and then it's a lottery system to see whose number comes up. You'll get notified, you call back and you can get your, your appointment for Evyshell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're exactly right. Evyshell is that prophylactic antibody that we give, protects up to six months or more um, against an infection, but also mostly important hospitalization and death risk. Um, we do have that tier system, just as you said, we are working through all those people that are in those tiers for uh, immunosuppression, those people that we don't believe would uh, optimally uh, react to the vaccine. Um, so we are working through that. We are trying to get as many people as possible, but to your point, Steve, a lot of it has to do with the supply. Joellen is saying that she suggests we ought to have a program about our immune system and how it works and what the differences are in ages. I think that's a great idea too, so we'll put that it on the list. It's a great I idea. I think we'll have Dr. Howard, I'll be back for that one. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. We do have we just have a Geyer. couple of- We have Dr. Geyer with you. That'd be pretty strong, oh, powerful yeah, combination yeah, right there. Yep. We just have a couple of more questions. Yin, Yang, Yin Lang was wanting to know, do we know if the treatment for the rectal cancer that we just talked about if that immunotherapy is expensive? So one study I saw was $11,000 a dose. How many doses do you have to have? 
Uh, it was one dose every, every three, three weeks, weeks for, for six, six months. Weeks. Six months, sorry, yeah. Okay, I'm going to try and do some math in my I mean, head okay. really fast here because that's, that's, that's like about $100,000 really. And that's what, you know, they, you know the, the cost basis of uh, a dose, but there are other factors, administration. Yeah, that's um, much and more. It's much more than that, unfortunately. Um, and we definitely need uh, approval through uh, pay, uh, insurances and, and um, to, to get it. Uh, are there any patient assistance programs? Yes, a lot of these companies have been very generous, uh, especially when there's early data like this. They've been very helpful in getting patients um, uh, um, free drug and assistance. And we've, at the Cancer Center, have worked with multiple companies to, to provide that for some of our patients. Okay, two more questions on this topic. Cindy wants to know, you, you've talked a little bit about this, and especially Dr. Ashcraft, I think, mentioned, but would you consider the 14 patients in the clinical trial cured of their cancer? Oh, I, I, that's a tough term. We, we, we prefer the term NED, no evidence of disease. Yes. Um, we, we try to withhold that term cure uh, because once, the, once you tell a patient they're cured and then something shows up, everybody's completely devastated. Um, remember that when a patient undergoes curative intent surgery, curative intent chemotherapy with Dr. Robert Shabi and his team, they're, they're put in what's called survivorship. And the idea is to monitor closely and to keep an eye on them for any chances of recurrence. And so we like to use the term no evidence of disease until we get like five years out. And that's when we really start confidently saying when it's, it, the chances of it coming back at five years are, are pretty minimal. Um, but we also have to remember the, the other thing we haven't touched on too much here, Steve, is that you know, the, the follow-up with, uh, with these patients is quite intense. Mm -hmm. um, the the follow-up with a patient who underwent routine treatment with us or kind of the standard treatment would be to see us every three months in clinic, get some blood work, CT scans every six months to a year, depending on how they're doing, and then colonoscopies as scheduled. But with uh, when you go this technique that we're talking about here, which is called watch and wait, mm -hmm. They have to be seen every three months and they have to get an endoscopy, which, whether it be a flexible sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy. They have to get MRIs every three months to four months um, and CT scans a lot more frequently as well. And so the, the follow-up for this can be rather intense. And so you need a patient that can be dedicated to that follow-up as well in order to really see the success that we're seeing. Okay, so that's um, a bowel prep every three months for a colonoscopy. Um, at the very least, a lot of enemas before you come in to see me. Yeah, yes. Well, okay. All right, last question. Dan and Michael have sort of the same question. They're wanting to know is, uh, would any of our cancer patients have access to this therapy through a clinical trial? And would we be enrolling people? So we, we, uh, we do have a clinical trial that um, is a cooperative group trial that we are going to open, which includes a different form of checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so the, but it's currently not uh, active at this point, and I can't really um, talk about the specifics, but the, this is an area of interest around the country uh, through the cooperative groups because, you know, these are rare populations, and uh, in order to have more data and more patients on these studies, we cooperate with uh, folks at, you know, different in big in comprehensive institutions like ours, uh, like MD Anderson and, 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 and people in the area, and we pool our, our patients into these studies to try to so, you know, definitely give a solid uh, result about, about this question um, in the future, and we are interested in that. But currently, we don't have a trial that's open specifically for this population, but we, are, we, we have it in the works. All right, so any other questions to today? No. No. All right. Well, let's get some final thoughts because this has been an amazing discussion. I just have to say, you know, I, I talk a lot about the intersection of faith, hope, and science, and I feel like today is emblematic of mm -hmm. that. Um, what, what a great time and great discussion. So first, let's start with, start with you, Dr. Ashcroft. I'm excited by this trial. I think it's very promising. Um, but remember, the science is just in its infancy here, and we got to see how it progresses. But I'm, I'm tremendously excited. Um, it could potentially put me out of work. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're going to have plenty of work. But we're going to have to talk about the smoke barbecue thing. Just <laughs> yes. I don't well, know um, I'm definitely excited all of, about this trial, too. And I think this is one of the major reasons I went into this field is to really look for discoveries like this uh, and, and, and benefit patients 
um, and, and, and cure cancer. That's what we really want to do. We don't want to uh, just treat and, and uh, cancer. We want to cure cancer. And I think this is a very good step in the right direction. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Hawkeye, final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, again, just great questions by our viewers. Uh, thank you to our guests. Um, always good, always good to see you. Dr. Ashcraft helped me. I think it's important to continue to endorse uh, preventive measures. So first of all, obviously vaccines, uh, vaccination, but also cancer screening, um, whether it's uh, breast cancer screening, mammograms, colonoscopies. We had a show about a lung cancer screening. Continue to talk with your medical teams. It's so vitally important to get screened early to find out any process and stop that process early. That intersection of faith, hope, and science. The faith that you have with your spiritual beliefs or in science or all the above. Hope that you're going to continue to get better because we know hope is a powerful medicine. And then science, which helps deliver great results. In my world of cystic fibrosis, it was the development of trikafta, which is take a life expectancy of 30 years and said, hey, now you got to worry about retirement and disability. I never thought I'd see that after 40 years in medicine. Something like this. Yeah. It's just astonishing. Yeah. And something like vaccination in such a short time, which has clearly changed the face of the pandemic. These are amazing times in which we live. We need all of your help. Please listen to the words, listen to the wisdom, and remember, that between faith, hope, and science, we can put those together and braid them together and create something that is really special and helps us continue to live and hope for the better that's just around the river bend, just around the corner. We'll see you all tomorrow. Don't forget, thanks you for being with us today. Don't forget you can catch our programs anytime by logging onto Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Jill, what is coming tomorrow and Friday? It's a story that has struck a chord with a lot of our viewers. A Wichita couple was expecting their first child earlier this year, and both caught COVID after thinking the vaccine was too new. In a special Encore episode, we'll go back and meet them and find out how that decision nearly proved disastrous. We'll be back live Friday at 8 a.m., so make it a great day. We go to war-torn Ukraine on Friday to hear from a healthcare system pushed to the brink. I'm Jessica Lovell. How one local organization is doing more than just putting a Band-Aid on the problem. We'll see you at 8 on these social media channels. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.